The following presentation was recorded live at the Richmond Marriott in Richmond, Virginia for the 29th Annual International Association of Square Dance Callers Convention. This is tape number 10, Fun Night. To get started uh, with this session, uh, this is a session on Fun Night, and uh, it's uh, giving you an opportunity to hear some of the ways in which uh, some of the folks have been doing it for a while may uh, give you some ideas on how to have fun with what we're doing. And, of course, as Jim mentioned in his speech, that we need to put the fun back in, make it easier, make it simpler. Uh, and uh, But that's primarily what we're going to be discussing here and talking about. We hope to get some input from you if you have ideas that you can share. And that's what this is all about, a sharing session. And... Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, on my left here is uh, Joe Casey. He's from uh, Dover, New Hampshire. He started dancing in 1947, started calling in 1949. He attended the first con uh, Color Lab convention in 74, currently club caller for two clubs. Uh, and I'm not going to read the rest of it, he says, uh, but he says, looking forward to meeting you, so on. So we won't say that. but. Uh, I'm Stu Shacklett. Uh, I've been at it for a while. Uh, and um, my wife's passing around a paper. We want everybody to be sure to sign this. If there's any questions or comments as we go through this, uh, we want you to be sure to come to a microphone and, and put it on the tape because this is a tape session. So we need all of the comments on the tapes. And uh, going back to me, I'm the director of the Kentucky Dance Institute. We're 49 years old this year. I'm the president of the Kentucky Dance Foundation. And we were the recipients of all of the Michael Herman music that he produced during his lifestyle or lifespan. And we have all of his inventory and everything that we got copyrights for has been digitally recorded on the hard drive and it's been recorded on CDs for the preservation of future generations. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of old-time vintage music, uh, stuff that was recorded on 12-inch 78 RPM records by Columbia called the DX series. A lot of vintage dances like the Dinky One Step, the Mississippi Dip, uh, those type things. Uh, that's we have all of that in our inventory. But uh, we're here to talk about fun night, and uh, both uh, Joe and myself have a handout that we're going to share with you after the discussion. We don't want you leafing through it while we're talking. So uh, to start things off, I'm going to turn it over to Joe and uh, let him start, and then uh, I'll fill in. Thank you, Stu. I guess we have to get up fairly close. Uh, at any time, if you'd like to make a comment or have a question, don't hesitate to jump in. Now, I'd like to start out with what my definition of a fun night is. Now, to me, a fun night or non-dancer event is an opportunity to introduce non-dancers to the sociability of square dancing and the pleasure of moving to music while providing an evening of entertainment. And I think we all should be aware of the fact that the entertainment part of that is why they hire you. They don't hire you to teach them square dancing. They hire you to entertain them. Now, there are many things that can and will affect the success of your evening's program. Who you are doing it for is probably one of the most important. And this could be uh, all adults, a church group. Uh, teens, uh, uh, here again, a church group, school session. Uh, it might even be all adults at a birthday party or an anniversary. And I think the most common one that I run into is the family one. And this is the one where you get the parents with their children. And it's not unusual to have number four man have his six-year-old daughter here and his three-year-old daughter here dancing, right? Now, each of these groups will affect not only your whole evening, but the music that you use, 
the length of the tips, in other words, how long you're going to keep them on the floor, as well as the tempo of your music. Now, the length of the event also affects what you do. And generally, when I'm hired, I try and shoot for an hour and a half at the most. Generally, non-dancers, uh, they'll get plenty of exercise in that amount of time. Uh, I will go for two hours. If it's much longer than that, I try to discourage it because I'd rather have them a short period, have a good time, and go away wanting more. The facility itself is going to affect what you can and cannot do. I have one that I do every year, and we dance on flagstones. Mm -hmm. We do not do a sachet-type movement like Virginia Reel. But I think we also should be aware that not only flagstones, but carpeting, grass, tar, and particularly if these people are in sneakers, these are dangerous surfaces. And you should think twice before you start sacheting down and back in a Virginia Reel. It'd be better to promenade down, promenade back. It's safer. Acoustic should not be a problem. As a professional square dance caller, you should go prepared to sound it, whatever it is. Uh, I generally go with a full yak stack, which I can split or use half of it. And I always carry a backup amplifier and turntable. Whether food is being served or not will also affect your night, and particularly if there is alcohol present. That can really do things. Uh, you should probably know in advance if there's a theme set for the evening. Is it a Western theme, uh, costume ball, uh, whatever, so that you can prepare for it. Now, your music can be utilized as a tool to create the type of feel that you want the group to have. If you've got a rowdy, rowdy bunch and you want to calm down, could you, let's see, can we start this up? Always be prepared, right? It had the brakes on. <laughs> all righty, we get all these things off this machine. We can go ahead and play it. Whoops. such as Small World, or zippity do that, that type of thing. And uh, sing along such as You Are My Sunshine, Beer, Bar Beer Barrel Polka, Four Leaf Clover, just because these type of tunes are generally well, uh, well received. However, if you feel your group would prefer the Pink Cadillac or all Beatles tunes, go for it. Now, experience and judgment, let's face it, they're your best weapons. The more of these you do, the more 
you are apt to do a good job. And the most intriguing thing about a fun night is, generally, you never know what you're going to get into. <laughs> okay, now for the nitty-gritty of just how do I run a one-night stand. I start in a big circle, everybody up, right? Then we establish couples. Now, with most groups, you wind up with couples with same sex. Uh, I don't worry about it. I did read on the callers' uh, email type thing, whatever, them computers type things. Somebody came up with the idea that the tallest person in that couple should be on the left, put the shorter one on the right. It would it should work, right? Now, it really doesn't matter too much because I don't generally use anything that says men do this or girls do that. I try and keep my whole night, heads do this, sides do that. Now, we're in the big circle, we establish couples, we identify the, the partner who is the most important person in square dancing. The other person beside you is the second most important person, and that's your corner. At that point, we can dance. Circle left, circle right, all go forward and back. Then while we're in the big circle, I add dosa do, partner corner, uh, promenade single file, and couples promenade. And that's about all I do in the big circle. Now, if the group is large enough, and the facility is large enough, uh, I then would put them into the Sicilian circle, which is one couple facing another couple around the big circle. You all know that. At this point, all we do is identify the opposite, uh, establish the direction they're going to travel around the big circle, and all we add at this point is two couples circling and pass through, because we want them to pass through, go on to the next couple. Say, hi, you know. And that is a great teaching formation, even in square dance classes, because you can teach everybody at the same time. And the session I was in, no, we won't get into that. That's nothing to do with one night stands. Now, my primary objective is to get them into squares before I let them sit down. So that means I'm going to limit the time that I spend in the big circle or in the Sicilian circle. Now, we form squares. All we have to do is identify home, state, uh, home position and tell them that when we promenade, we always stop at home. With that, we can just go ahead and dance using what they've already learned. And, and then I let them rest, explaining that when we get up, we're going to get up in the squares and how you do it, you know, need two couples. And probably, between tips, I'll put on a line dance. Now, one of the easiest ones that I know of is The Lion Sleeps Tonight, which, uh, although I think I've seen some easier ones <laughs> since then, like yesterday afternoon or yesterday morning. Uh, it does not require learning a heck of a lot. You go side, close, side, side, close, side, forward, two, three, turn back, two, three. That's it. That's the dance. Now, once we get them back up on the floor again, uh, we review everything that we've done up to this point without adding anything new. Then, after we've reviewed that, we identify heads and sides, and then we can go ahead and dance again. Uh, heads forward and back, forward, dose to do the opposite, back out to place. Sides forward and back. Dosa do the opposite, back out to place. And we can do singing calls at this point also. And I rarely use a partner exchange on a one night stand. And I pre prompt or prompt singing calls, singing only during the circles, circle left, circle right, or promenades. And uh, I've also picked up some nice figures at that seminar. <laughs> but things like heads forward and back, forward again, circle left, once around, back out, 
sides forward and back, circle left once around, back out. And then you can do another whole dance with circling right once around. It's all brand new. Now, in the handout that I, I've made up, uh, I've included several figures that I might use on a fun night, and I've also listed some of the other records that I might carry. Uh, ones that I forgot to list is I would carry a special event record for happy birthdays, uh, waltzes, polkas, and country western music. Now, at this point, we've used honors, do to do forward and back, pass through, circle, and promenade. And at that, with that, you can do an hour and a half program, and very successfully, using different music, uh, without having to tax their memory any further. However, if I do feel that something else would enhance the program, I am apt to include a courtesy turn, because I've got my pass through already, and I can courtesy turn. Also, I can pass through, separate around the outside, get back home. Uh, possibly uh, stars, as long as it's heads and sides. I don't use men's star or ladies star. Heads go forward and back. Stick your right hand in the middle and turn it once around. Back out. I don't go to a corner Alabama left or anything like that. Now, I didn't include any patter figures, um, but any of those singing calls could be done to patter. Uh, others that I might use is uh, with the old hot time in the old town tonight figure. Couple one lead out, circle four, pick up two more, circle six, pick up two more, circle eight. That's something they can do. Uh, if I get a, a rambunctious bunch of younger people, I'm apt to do Sally Gooden. Are you all familiar with Sally Gooden? First gent to the right, turn the right hand lady by the right hand round, back to your partner, turn to the left, all the way around the corner girl, turn that corner by the right hand round, back to your own, turn to the left, and across the hall, the opposite swing, and run back home, same old thing. You can do the two hand swing. We do that with each couple. Then we do it heads working at the same time. And then sides at the same time, and then all four couples. And this, you have to be careful. Because <laughs> when you say, go across the hall, they will not use a star. They fight their way across. <laughs> then they fight their way back. But it, it takes a particular group before I would use it. Now, one of the most important factors at a fun night and or any square dance function, of course, is to avoid frustrating people. And this was, came out in the last session I went with, uh, I was at where Mike and uh, Don Beck were talking. Don't embarrass anyone. Don't get them frustrated. Now, something that might be a little unusual for me, uh, what I don't do, is I do not try to recruit at a fun night. If someone asks me, where can I do this more, you know? I tell them. But I'm relying on the fact that if they have a good time, they will then notice posters and advertisements saying Square Dance. Once you are aware of something, you see it. You know, if you, if you all of a sudden you took up whatever, you would start seeing their ads in the paper. Now, my personal belief, excuse me, excuse me my personal, pers personal belief is that any square dance event should be an enjoyable experience sharing the music and the fellowship with others. And the key elements to success at a fun night are enthusiasm and simplicity. Thank you. Okay, real fine. Give Joe a hand here, gang. And, you know, uh, he's mentioned a number of things that uh, uh, have been coming out in a number of the discussions that have happened already here at uh, Color Lab. Uh, for instance, he put the emphasis on let's keep it simple, you know, make it easy, early success for the dancers. And that's extremely important, the dancers to be successful at what you're attempting to teach them so that they can build confidence in their ability. So 
uh, those are the types of things we keep in mind. Now, he mentioned one thing here that can't be taught. We cannot teach any of you how to make a judgment on what's happening on the floor. That comes from personal experiences. And it's, it's over a period of time that you get these personal experiences. It's not something that somebody can sit down and teach you, well, you do this if this happens. All of these situations are different, and you've got to make adjustments to all of these situations, and it only comes from experience of being there and have done that before and know what works and what doesn't work. So you don't have a cut and dry answer that if this happens, do this, because it's not always the same. It's always a different situation. Uh, my programming uh, is very similar to uh, the things that Joe has talked about here. However, I work with some uh, diversified groups. I work with uh, homeschooling children uh, as a part of their requirement for physical education. Uh, we do some uh, dancing with them. And I lend more toward the community dance program than I do just strictly square dancing with them. Uh, we do some other things besides square dancing. We do some international folk. Uh, we do some line dances. We do some square. We do some contra. A little bit of everything to give them a variety of a, uh, a dance experience. And then we also have a group that uh, I've just started uh, with a 4-H children in our community. Uh, they, uh, when they... It took us two years to get them to accept this idea to begin with. But once they accepted it and they sent out information to all of the parents and students and say, who would be interested in doing some square dancing, you know, in your area as a project for 4-H? Well, we got 48 names that came back to us of children who were interested in this. So we're looking forward to what's going to happen with this now. We've only had one session with them so far, but uh, hopefully that it'll snowball as it continues to grow other children will find out how much fun they're having and maybe want to join it too and we hope that it'll grow bigger than our facility that we'll have to be looking for a bigger place to dance uh, another area of programs that i work on is elder hostels uh, i do a number of elder hostels uh, each year for the university of kentucky and it's uh, usually done at lake cumberland and uh, each of these sessions are different in that uh, you were, have anywhere from uh, four to six squares each time that you meet, uh, depending upon registrations. And sometimes you will have a number of people who are experienced dancers, can do plus and even uh, A1. And, uh, of course, you've got to provide a program then for the people who can't even start to, you know, move to music, and then that A1 dancer who's on the other end of the spectrum. So it's a challenge to come up with things that you can keep both groups happy with. Now, what I normally do, I start at the bottom, and uh, hopefully that the experienced dancers will stick with me for a while, and then I put a separate session for the experienced dancers to get together and practice a routine of some sort that we can show off later in the week to the people who we're teaching the basics to. And that seems to satisfy them, that need to do a little more and, and get out there in front. Uh, so we handle it that way. But the groups that I start with, of course, we start with uh, mixers to sort of get them moving the music. I, wanna, I want them to be successful. And there are a number of mixers that I use, and I'd like to just give you some examples of some of the music. Uh, this first one, let's see. This is uh, called the Swiss Break Mixer. Is anyone familiar with it? Anyone not familiar with the Swiss Break Mixer? One, two, three people, four people, five people. How many are not voting? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I just didn't think some of you were. Okay. But this, this is a real simple little thing in that you walk for eight counts. You face your partner and back away four counts. You stamp your feet one, two, three, and clap two, three. And then you walk back to your partner with a right hand and turn in eight counts. And then you leave your partner and go to somebody else and join left hands and turn. And after that eight count phrase, you start walking again. So it's that simple. This is the music, I think. Play. 
Swiss Break Mixer. Back away. Stand. One, two, three. Left, two, three. Forward. Right hand turn. On to the next left hand turn. Take this person. Promenade. Go. One, two, three, four. And it's that simple. You can get them walking to it, and the only thing you have to do is know how to back away and clap and stamp, and boy, you got them moving real quick. Uh, I like to use this on my uh, record player, though, in that I can slow it down then. The, the, the disc that I have here, I can't slow it down on this piece of equipment. But uh, that's one of the ones I like to use. I have one that I've written that I like to show off with because this is one that I wrote for my wife called Kathy's Delight. And it's a good piece of music called the Military Two Step. Sort of a Scottish simple that the people can get into it. within say a minute you got them taught uh, the sequence and they can go into the hand clapping is the hardest part of the dance the sequence of hand clapping everybody else can walk and back away that's no problem but get them to do that sequence of hand clapping and you'll get all kinds of sequences uh, both right left partner you know all of that but uh, that straightens out after a while but it's called uh, Kathy's Delight and I do it to the military two-step Okay, let's see what else I got here. Of course, all of you should be familiar with uh, the Tennessee Wig Walk. That's an old one. It's been around for years. Uh, Everywhere Mixer, and of course the one that uh, Mr. Jerry Hilt and Kathy wrote called Jiffy Mixer, which is very, very popular. And I understand we've got a line dance to that now, sort of a Jiffy line dance. Uh, so uh, all of those are still available. Here's another one I use, and uh, let's see. We're still in the mixer stage now. I'm finding the right number for the tape. There we go. This is called the Mexican mixer. <laughs> A little bit different flavor of the music, but... mixer gives you a different feel. The Swiss brake mixer gives you a little alpine flavor. The Mexican mixer gives you south of the border type flavor. And of course the Tennessee wig walk gives you the mountain flavor of the Tennessee and Kentucky area. Uh, the everywhere mixer is very popular. And of course the Jiffy mixer uh, is one that we all love. So those are the some of the mixers that I would use to sort of get the people moving real quick to music. Now, I don't use all of these. I don't go down the list and do eight mixers in a row. I might just do one. And then the next day, I might use a different one to get them started. But I usually start them in a big circle, get them moving to the music, and with early success, I want them to be successful in the first thing that we do. So it builds confidence in them that they're going to be able to do whatever uh, you know we're going to be doing during the program. From there, then I go into uh, some type of uh, square figures, and again I limit 
my teaching of squares to uh, a limited number of basic fundamentals. Uh, with about five or six basics, uh, like Joe mentioned, it, you can do any number of uh, dance combinations with just a few basics. And uh, I, of course, circle left, circle right, alley in the left, uh, a promenade, and a pass-through are some of the first ones I use. Now, once I get them doing pass-throughs, uh, and possibly a, a arm turn with partner call a swing. They can swing with an arm turn or whatever they want to do. And 99% of the time, if you just say swing your partner, they'll figure out something to do with partner. You don't have to tell them, you know, put your arm here and put your arm there and, and paddle this foot here. You don't have to tell them that. They'll figure some way to turn their partner or swing their partner. And so I don't waste a lot of time in teaching the basics the way I would in a beginner class with all of the little courtesies and, and the fundamentals involved in that actual performance of that basic, but I just do the bare minimum to get them to do what I want them to. After I've taught them a uh, pass-through is the hardest thing, uh, then I can go into singing calls. And uh, here again, it's up to you to be able to adjust singing calls to fit the crowd that you're working with. Now, if you've got a singing call that's a beautiful piece of music and you enjoy it and people really like this music and it's got a relay the deucey in it with a spin chain through, uh, you don't want to use that with a group that's never done this before. So I changed the figure. And it's a good practice to uh, take a figure from one dance that you're really familiar with and put it in a different singing call to see if it'll fit. Now it'll fit because it's usually a 64 count figure. And learn to make that transition to take that simple into a, uh, a more complex dance and remove the complexity of the dance itself and use the simple dance and you can still enjoy that music that uh, is so popular and uh, that you want to do. So uh, making those adjustments, it's, of course, up to you. You've, and again, that can't be taught. We can't teach you how to do that. But you've got to take the initiative and say, okay, I know that if you square through four hands, right, left, through, die through, square through, swing corner, uh, hey, that works in this singing call. Why wouldn't it work over here? And try it over here in another singing call, and then another singing call, then another singing call. And when you get those patterns that you know will work, the 64 count figures that will bring you back to home when you're supposed to be there, then you can transpose those into any dance that you want to call. You don't have to have the, the calls that are written for that particular dance to do that particular record. So make that transition, be able to, you know, make those adjustments. I was told in uh, college when I was going through my recreation uh, physical education classes by one of the instructors, there's three things that you have to remember. And if you remember these three things, you can take any situation and make any program work. And those were improvise, adjust, and modify. Improvise, adjust, I-A-M. Improvise, adjust, and modify. So if you take something and it doesn't work, improvise, make it work. Uh, adjust it, uh, modify it whatever but those three things remember that and you can make all of these things work in any situation you want them to work in now we've been going quite a while here uh does anybody have a question or an idea that you want to throw out at this time or do you have any questions for either one of us right now we've still got some more things we're going to share with you but uh anybody want it nobody wants it we boy we really snowed him joe <laughs> monica now <laughs> Um, Mona, you have to come up with the mic, on. This is Mona Canal. I just wanted to say that a lot of fun nighters that we do are for special populations. Uh, people interested in living history, family groups, um, special populations of children with perhaps handicaps, physical or mental. Um, things where we have 10 guys and 98 girls and so in those situations 
you have to really adapt your material. And a lot of times, square dancing means to me, in those situations, the content of what they actually perform on the floor, not the formation that they're in, or the relationship of partners, and that sort of thing that we normally think of in terms of square dancing. The square dancing goes far beyond the square. Thank you, Mona. Anyone else have a comment that you want to add at this time? Okay. Joe, you want to talk some more? No. <laughs> but he will. Okay. I... I'm afraid that I don't have the repertoire of material that uh, Stu is talking about, but then I do not do a, a series with non-dancers. Uh, if I'm working with non-dancers in a series, it is a squid dance class. It is not a one-night stand or a fun night. Uh, we, get, we have to get away from that term of one-night stand. It has other meanings. Just like we no longer do demonstrations, we do exhibitions, right? Anyhow, uh, to me, the, the fun night itself is an opportunity to let these people experience basically the difference between traditional and modern square dancing. The figures I'm using are traditional. However, the type of calling I will, once they got these figures and they're doing fine, I will hash them up so that they, they realize that modern square dancing is just a little bit different than the traditional where you would walk them through and repeat this figure for the whole dance. <coughs> now, I'm not saying I'm going to hash up a singing call. I'm going to show them the figure I'm going to use in the singing call, and I will use it the four times. However, near the end of the evening, if I put on a patter racket, there's no reason I can't have heads go forward and back, forward again, do to do, sides promenade outside halfway around, forward and back, do to do the opposite, heads promenade halfway. You know, you can use the things that you've been doing that they are familiar with and, and do it without telling them in advance that you're going to do it, which is basically the difference between traditional dancing and modern dancing, as I understand it. Okay, thanks, Joe. We have another uh, question or comment down here. Jerry, <coughs> Jerry Helton, Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm curious, uh, how do you, this would be, I guess, under the heading of Fun Night. What do you charge? How much money? Okay, I, in, I don't know about Joe, but in my situation, it depends upon the group I'm working with. Uh, for instance, I'm doing a, a thing on Friday nights now, uh, and it's a two-hour dance, and I get $100. Uh, and by the same token, I go out Thursday night, and I do a dance, and I get maybe $6. Uh, so it depends upon the group and as to what they can afford. Uh, I was telling Jerry about this last uh, situation I was in. Uh, I had a lady in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, who called me and said, would you come and do a uh, wedding reception for my son who's going to be getting married? And uh, I said, well, I don't know. I, that's a six-hour drive for me. I don't know whether I want to go or not. And I told my wife, I, I think I'll just price this out of the market, and she won't hire me. And I thought I had, but I didn't. <laughs> And she hired me, and now she expects me to come back for that same price, and uh, so I'm sort of stuck with it right now for a while at least. But, uh, uh, yeah, if, if you know the money's there, and if it's a, not a charitable organization that, you know, needs the money, uh, then they should pay. Uh, but uh, if, if it's, uh, for instance, a charitable organization, I don't charge anything. Uh, my wife and I go down through Louisiana. Well, we go down to, to San Antonio for the folk festival every year in March. From there, we go to Louisiana to a community center. It's called the Finstead Center uh, in uh, Grand Coteau, Louisiana. Uh, it's a small community, and there are some nuns down there that taught her when she's in high school. 
So she goes to visit with the nuns, and they have this community center that they have. And so we do some programs for them in the community center. They get the children in there one afternoon, and we'll do children's stuff, children's dances and uh, play parties and things like this. Uh, and then in the evenings, uh, they'll bring the seniors in, and we'll do a program for the seniors. Now, we don't charge them for this. We do this for free. Uh, this year, they've added <laughs> another place to us. There's a place for uh, women who have been abused, and it's uh, up in, what's the name of the place? No. Anyhow, it's north of uh, Lafayette there in Louisiana, and... Uh, uh, we go there and we do something with the mothers and then we do a program for the children who are there with their mothers. And uh, it's very gratifying to get the things from these people. I mean, they don't pay me anything other than saying thank you for coming. And it's really very gratifying to get that. Now, you know, when I was much younger uh, and I used to do a lot of calling uh, every place, I would expect to be paid. But now I don't. They, if I can go and provide some fun and enjoyment for people, uh, then uh, I feel I've been paid with the enjoyment that they get, especially when you're working with seniors. Another question down here. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear more about this uh, Elder Hostel program. Uh, Joe says an hour and a half for non-dancers, maybe two hours. Uh, tell me, uh, uh, Elder Hostel, I assume you've got people there half a day, a day, uh, more than one day. Uh, I'm Ted, Ted Cromack from Shelburne, Mass. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, in the Elder Hostel that I work with, uh, it's uh, sponsored by the University of Kentucky, and uh, it's done at their leadership center down in uh, Jabez. You ever heard of Jabez, Kentucky? Well... That's the way they pronounce it, uh, pronounce it. And uh, we have a class that goes for an hour and a half for five days. It's a whole week. When you go to an elder hostel, there'll be three subjects taught. And in our particular elder hostel that I work with, uh, dance is one. And a lot of times it'll be Appalachian dancing. Big circles are the running set. Uh, if it's modern square dancing they want, then I do that. Uh, if it's line dancing they want, then I do that. Uh, I, I'm not peculiar as to what type I do. Whatever they want, that's what will satisfy. Then another subject that they get is mountain music. And there are, uh, is a lady and a man who are the coordinators of this uh, elder hostel. And they play the bass, the guitar, the mandolin, the banjo, the hammer dulcimer, the lap dulcimer, and the harmonicas. And both of them switch off and play all these things. And they play all of this country music, and it's from the hills of West Virginia and Kentucky area. And uh, then we have another gentleman that comes from uh, uh, Bowling Green University at Western State uh, College, or S Strait University, I guess it's called now. But it's in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And he teaches uh, folklore uh, about folk remedies, uh, ghost stories, uh, killings in the area. He's got about a five-county area there he's done research in, and he's got recorded all the killings that have taken place in that uh, particular area. And he tells about these and where the people are buried and so on. If the people are interested, he'll take them out to the graveyards and show them the graveyards where they're buried and so on. But it's, uh, that's one of the subjects. The other one is music and the other is dance. And the dance that we do, we sort of try to, you know, fill the need that's there, whatever is there. Now, you have to come up here. Okay, we have another question coming up. Deb Sutter from Dubuque, Iowa. You said you uh, teach um, homeschool children to do this as a re uh, part of the requirement for physical education. How do you do that without being accredited by the state as a teacher, that it would be accepted as a credit for them? I don't uh, get involved in the politics. I just know that they have to have so many hours, and I'll verify on a piece of paper they'll give me, and I'll say, yeah, they have, you know, completed this. Now, now I've got a teaching certificate in the state of Kentucky, so I'm a accredited teacher, uh, but I don't use my certificate. And I've been a teacher for, you know, like 60 years, so uh, I don't think there's a question about that end of it. 
but as long as it satisfies the need of the whoever the powers to be would accept, uh, then um, you know that's that's the only thing I'm concerned about. But yes, another come up here, on Here we have another one. Ruth Edison from New Jersey. In New Jersey, they accept it. They they just say, okay, if you have X number of hours, that's fine. For uh, uh, square dancing, it's completely uh, acceptable as uh, physical ed. So they have no they've had no problems with that at all. I, I really I don't know. I yeah, the, most of them are mothers, right? Yeah. Well, come up and put your question on tape. I'm Jerry Sostman from North Carolina. Uh, the people that I know in homeschooling in North Carolina, uh, the mothers are not required to have a teaching certificate. They're mothers. They're not teachers. Now, they get programs from the state and things like that, but they don't have a teaching certificate. Very good. Here's another question. It's on, it's on the same line of homeschooling. By the way, I'm Lynn Webster from the Twin Cities. How do you get started in something like that? If I wanted to start calling for homeschools, is there like a way to promote yourself or a way to get in contact with people? It's, uh, I don't know. I, I fell into this myself uh, in that somebody uh, else had been doing this and they couldn't do it. Uh, and they called me and said, would you do this, cover this for me? And I said, sure. And they liked me better than they did him. So uh, <laughs> when they got ready to call back, they called me and didn't call him. So uh, that's the way I got started. So I don't know. But I imagine if you go to the Board of Education or something and find out where the homeschool facilities are or who's running those facilities, then you can contact the people in your area and see if they would be interested in something like that. Okay, another, come on up here. Another question. Uh, we call the Board of Education uh, locally, and they have a record of everybody who's a homeschooler, because I think they get their certificates actually from where you are, from the state or from, you know, graduation and everything. They actually get uh, certificates. Okay, so call your local Board of Education and see if they can give you some guidance on who to contact. Mm -hmm. Does that help you, Lynn? Good. <laughs> for, an, for an initial, <coughs> I'm on a panel from Dayton, Ohio. For an initial contact, sometimes what happens is you have done a one-nighter for a church group or for um, a Sunday school class or for a Girl Scout group, and they have enjoyed it immensely, and they pass your name along to the teachers in the school, or to the school board, or to somebody from a different school who wants to have the same kind of party. And that's the way I got started, and once I got into the schools, within the school started to call me to come in during the daytime and do in-service weeks for dancing with them. And once you start in the schools, nobody ever thinks about asking you for a license. Once you get in, and if you get in with a good fun night party, um, then that's the best recommendation you can have sometimes. Okay, thank you, Bona. Joe's got a comment. Uh, I have a daughter-in-law who has done homeschooling, and what little I know about it is what I've just picked up along the way. But I do know that uh, the students have to pass tests, which are state tests. And I also know that there are subjects that are not taught by the mothers, that they have to get together all the homeschoolers and attend a specific weekend or something like this, say for biology or, or some subject that would not be probably uh, in the area where any mother would be able to do it right off the top of the head. So uh, somehow or other, if you could find out where they get together and when you could approach through that way. Okay, very good. Anybody else? Come on up here. What's your name? I'll, I'll meet you halfway. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you, Stu. Um, I have a question, uh, maybe leading, but I've been recalling a few years uh, next to you guys, but uh, I don't want to get out of the middle. Um, I'd like to get back to the basic if we can. Joe has introduced and started it. I think that practically every one of us suffers the problem of getting the first nighter, the new dancer, the fun dancer, who's the guy who's been dragged out to the dance, to get up on that floor, that first thing. It, that seems to be the basic problem. Uh, I watched a man named Paul Hartman years ago, and uh, Paul had something that he did that I copied, and I bought it, and I'm sure that Stu's used it a lot, and it's the old snake dance. Can you explain the old snake dance? It's an easy way to get people up, and I'd like to have you give that to me. Sure. Uh, normally, uh, if you get them in a big circle, uh, you can have a designated person then to start breaking away from that circle and go on the inside and pull everybody else behind them into this big circular pattern. Uh, now, if those of you that are in the community dance program, Jerry Hill talked about this yesterday, uh, then you reverse it and come back out and go back into your circle again. Or you can uh, put them into a grand march pattern and bring them down in eights, as Jerry did in the community dance program, uh, and get them into squares from there. But, yeah, the, the snake type thing, you can, if you put them in a grand march and end up in lines, then you can snake through the lines and let them hook on as you come by and end up in your big circle again. Uh, and there are a number of ways of doing grand marches and snakes and things like this that would get the people moving to music rather quickly. And all they have to do is be able to walk. But have a good marching type sound uh, for a grand march. Uh, you don't want to get one of these jazzy songs here that does not have the feel of moving to the music. Uh, but uh, that's basically what I do, uh, Deco. So I don't know, Joe, you have anything different? No? Okay. Come up here, John, if you want to ask a question. Make a comment, then. Uh, John Callahan of uh, Rockland County, New York. Uh, I do a lot of uh, Father Daughter Girl Scouts dance. And... Uh, uh, the girls are all ready to come out in a big circle and that, and I just use a phrase for the fathers, this is going to be a walking dance, that's all you have to do is walk, and that seems to quiet them and uh, give them the courage they need to come. Very good suggestion. Yeah, come on up here. Uh, I hate to get back off the subject again, but we we talk, we were talking a bit about oh yes, my, who, what is it? Oh, thank you. I couldn't remember that. My name is Johnny Wedge from Massachusetts. We were talking a bit ago about the subject of of certification, and I just thought it would be interesting to tell you an experience that happened to me. I was contacted by a community in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to do a thing for adult education. Uh, there was going to be an evening program, and they had some thoughts, and they called me in, and they said. You know, we were thinking, and we understand you do this. Uh, matter of fact, at first, I mentioned something about auctioneer. But anyway, we got down to square dancing, and, and, and we had pretty much settled in how they were going to pay me. It was going to come from the uh, education committee of the town. And then finally, the last question came up, but what do you have for certification that tells us that you are a, a caller? And I said, I don't know. I, I have a certificate from an organization known as the International Association of Square Dance Callers. It's called Caller Lab. And it is a certificate that says, I am certified. And when they saw that certificate, they were very pleased. And they said, that certainly meets all of our requirements. I thought you might be interested to hear that. Very good. Uh, just to add to that, you might mention the fact that you are licensed by ASCAP and BMI. That's always a good uh, in. That covers the area of the uh, use of music and things, and it won't get the schools in, in uh, difficulty with BMI or ASCAP. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this is very interesting, getting these comments and questions from, from you, because there are things I know that other people are also wondering about, and it might be uh, answering some of the questions they have on their mind. 
Anybody else have something? Yes, come on up. Paul Walker from North Carolina. I just want to say we had uh, one case where I, I got it called by a uh, Girl Scout troop to come out and do a, a birthday party for a group of girls. And I'm thinking, how am I going to do square dancing with all girls? Well, some people have a bag of tr tricks, and I had an old bag of hats, just these baseball hats. So I took the baseball hats out there in a big bag, and I told the little girls, I said, we had about 50 girls in a group. And I said, we got a real problem because I said, square dancing is done with guys. I said, you don't have any boys here. So do any of you girls think that you can accept the challenge of doing the boys' part? Fifty hands went right up in the air. So I started handing out the hats, and it really worked well. It really worked well. Uh, another thing on the homeschool program, we had a case, uh, we just fell into it this past year, where we had six teenagers come uh, to our class, square dance class, and they brought their parents with them. They were homeschooled children. We found out uh, several things. One, um, that there is each county in our area has a county homeschool association. Uh, then the state also has a homeschool association. And in August of each year, they put out a newsletter to all the homeschooled parents telling them of all these socialization activities that are going to be available. And they're looking for places so that their children can come and increase their social skills with others. And uh, we're going to set up a uh, market program uh, this coming year to get into the homeschool program because it's a market that we've never really tapped on a real dedicated basis. And the, uh, there's 2.3 million children in homeschool now, and within five years they expect it to be between four and five million children that's going to be in that program. It's a tremendous market, and a lot of businesses are being formed to address the issue of teaching children at home. Uh, that's an extremely clever, motivating factor uh, to challenge the girls to be uh, come familiar with the boys' parts, and uh, that is a good way. Uh, I carry with me, just about every place I go, a, a box of old neckties that I've gone down to the Goodwill and bought for cent 10 cents a piece. And I put a knot in them and uh, put them all in this box, and you should see the key kids trying to match colors. You know, oh, there's a blue one. I've got a blue shirt. And uh, so you know, they fight over the colors and everything. But it, it provides that difference so that you have two girls dancing together. One of them has a tie on. You know, hey, that's the boy. And that helps, too. But, uh, yeah, that's necessary to have something like that and be prepared for that. Yeah. Do you have some sort of a party tape available, a videotape of some kind that has this sort of dancing on it? Uh, no. No. I really don't uh, have a tape available. However, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think we're supposed to plug, uh, you know, things, but uh, I'm going to do it anyhow. The Kentucky Dance Foundation has a number of tapes available, some of which Jerry Hilt has made, uh, and they have to do with this type of thing, uh, the first night, fun night type dancing, and also has some by Bob Howe, but it's through the Kentucky Dance Foundation. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't have any tapes like that. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that they're out there. <laughs> Okay, any other questions or comments? All right. I, I have another uh, a tune here that I use considerably, especially at every elder hostel I go to. I use this, and usually close to the end of the evening program. Now, if we have some folks that come to the elder hostel who uh, can't dance, they, they've, you know, they're, they're on walkers or something, uh, then we get them in this particular dance, and then at the end of the sessions, we give them a certificate like everybody else for participating in the dancing portion. 
And uh, I'm sure all of you have heard this or have done it before, but this is what it is. Remember, friendship song. Let's all join hands in friendship. Let's all join hands in friendship. For everyone to see.
I'm gonna. I, I guess I'm gonna be a little bit critical of Caller Lab about this year because something wonderful happened to me this year, and I want it to go on tape. Hopefully that people will hear it and maybe want to change how they do things next year. Um, this year I went to the community dance uh, program uh, Saturday and Sunday. Saturday night we had an additional dance, then we had some more dancing from 3 to 5 yesterday. Um, but we spent an awful lot of time in those two days covering just about everything that was said here today in 45 minutes. Now, everything that Stu and Joe and everybody else contributed is all good information, but I feel we did not get the flavor of what everybody was saying because we didn't hear a lot of the music. We didn't get up and dance it. We weren't shown how it was taught. Okay? Um, I learned an awful lot. Now, um, Joe knew me since I was 17 years old, and I had hair, and, well, um, but to make a long story short, I, I'm, I'm saying all of this for a reason, is I've now been doing Fun Nights 30 years, club level through A2, 25 years, and I have not had the, the amount of um, experience that Joe and Stu has with the one night parties and so on. I do my own thing with modern western stuff. But after going to the community dance program, I've got gotten a total appreci different appreciation for what other people can do, but also because I haven't done it myself, I got to see how they teach it. My suggestion to Caller Lab is to offer a um, another session like this, but have it last a whole day where they can cover the same topics, teach us a couple contras, show what a Sicilian circle looks like, show what it's like to move up two people. And just to see that um, we can help everybody with their teaching. Me attending this uh, session with the community dance program has taught me how to teach some of these things. Alrighty? And I guess my criticism is to call a lab for not offering the kind of information that we had today but in a more detailed um, way of having us feel the music, dance to the music, and how to teach it. This year's uh, uh, theme is teaching is fundamental. Well, we're talking about an awful lot of teaching here, and we're talking about how to keep it fun, and fundamental to keep it simple. And uh, the best thing I did, to be honest with you so far, was the community dance program because um, the information there is just not a six or eight week period uh, of, of, of what to do in six, eight, eight weeks. It shows different dances that can be done on a one night basis only or several nights or even as you start your modern western dancing. So um, my advice would be to encourage everybody to sign up next year for the community dance program to get some real, real benefit of, of uh, feel of the music, how to keep simple how to have fun, but also how to teach some of the things that we're not used to doing. I think it's wonderful to hear what music would you select. It's, it's easy to say back up three, four with no criticism, but it's a lot different if we have the chance to physically get up. So I would make an outcry to call a lab saying, okay, let's do a community dance program, but have it during the regular uh, day sessions to experience the things that you're talking about in your seminars. Talking about them in cinema, cinemas. My tang gets all tungled after too many martinis and I develop a peach impediment. but um, it's the, um, um, I had no idea I would be passionate like this about what I'm saying because I came to the community dance program this year with no expectations without knowing what I would see. But now that I've seen it and danced it, okay, I can see how valuable this information is, but we're not getting the full effect from it from not experiencing it. So please attend the community dance program next year if you can, or tell Caller Lab, we want to have this kind of seminar longer and more detailed so we can learn from it instead of going over general topics. Thank you.
Thank you, Dave. And I'll second the <laughs> second the fact that uh, that program was unbelievably uh, successful. Uh, those of you who, because of work or other reasons, were unable to get there, missed a tremendous session. I was unable to be here Saturday. Saturday? Saturday, yeah. <sighs> I forget what day it is. But we did get there for the Sunday morning session, and believe me, the, the price of the entire seminar that Sunday morning was worth it. Yes. My name is Jennifer Dawson. I'm from Tucson, Arizona, and I want to reinforce what Dave has said. I'm a ringer. I'm not a square dancer. Uh, I have spent most of my time doing contra dancing over the past few years. I had a very, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm one of those traumatized people. I had a very, very bad experience with square dancing 20 years ago, and it's taken me a long time to get over it. I was a beginner. I took a six-week class. There was a party at the end, and all of a sudden, there my husband and I were with a bunch of people who were much more experienced than I was, and some of them helped us get through the squares, and others of them just watched us crash and burn. And after that, I said, uh-uh, I don't do this. So about three months ago, I began to get some information from Caller Lab. I began to get interested. I looked at the mainstream program and went, oh my God, there's no way I can ever do this. But I came here because I wanted to see what it was all about. And I want to say that the community dance program has basically changed my mind about square dancing. Because I'm now realizing that I do not have to be the perfect caller. I do not have to have a huge variety of steps under my belt. I can go give people a wonderful evening's entertainment, which is what I want to do. I want to take those people who think either you're born Fred Astaire or you're not. And I want to take the knots and say, hi, you can do this too. And I'm now realizing just from the other day when we had a seminar with, I think it was three dance steps, um, ladies chain, circle left, and right and left through. Oh my God, you could go on for 40 years just with those. And I was going, this I can do. You know, so I want to thank uh, Caller Lab for allowing me to be here. I want to thank the community dance program because now I'm thinking I can be a very well-rounded dance teacher. I have this phenomenal smorgasbord of things to choose from. And as the years, months, decades go by, yes, maybe I will eventually get to be a mainstream caller, a plus caller, whatever. But that doesn't mean I can't help people dance. And that's what I want to do. So um, thank you. And believe me, I'm, I'm with Dave. If character, um, you know, if community dance program wants a character witness, I'm right here because I just had a fabulous time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you know, a lot of what we've been talking about uh, is where our future customers can come from, too. If we do not push people, you will retain more of them. And let's face it, there will still be the two or three couples that come to that type of program which say, hey, we're going to get more. Go. No. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Barry Hendricks from Arlington, Texas. You guys probably know where that is because one of our more famous residents. And I used, I used to be the second best caller in Arlington, Texas until John got married. <laughs> now I'm number three. Anyway, uh, it, about ten years ago, I, I, it, to help you guys who are talking about the community dance program, I attended a seminar, a week-long seminar put on by Cal Campbell, and some other leaders, and the Lloyd Shaw Foundation that gave me a wealth of CDP one-night stand material. I, I don't know if Cal's still doing that, but I, if there was enough interest, I think he would resurrect that. It happens around a folk dance weekend, I assume that Lloyd Shaw still does. Are you familiar with that, Stu? That happens around Colorado Springs, and after you finish the program, where Cal and the guy, other guy people teach you, then you work with a group of experienced community dance people that night and the next day. Uh, if you're interested, do you know about that, Stu? Is they still doing that? Yeah. Okay. 
it uh i i don't know that they're still active in doing that sequence that you're talking about but i think they still have the leadership course that goes on and i don't know whether it's in conjunction with the other their actual uh, weekend is or week is down in uh, cumberland at jabez kentucky and that's usually like the first week second week of august something like that so i'm not sure the you know comparison there uh we we got another hand up back here and uh while he's coming up uh I would like to say now, we don't want to mix apples and oranges. Uh, what we did uh, on Saturday and Sunday was a community dance program. What we're talking about here is not necessarily a community dance program. What we're talking here is about fun night. Okay? And But much... Well, much, much of what we do on a fun night is stuff that can be used in the community dance program. So, yes, there is a correlation there between the two but they are different entities, okay? Uh, here we go. Francis Zeller from McCracken, Kansas. In regard to your uh, little talk about this uh, Cal Camels thing, I think I read a piece in the Square Dance magazine that was handed out up here that there is one of those coming up in Albuquerque sometime in the near future. And, and uh, you might look through that magazine because I'm... Is that what it is? Yeah, okay. And uh, if you live in that area, I'm sure it would be beneficial for you to go. Uh, I have one other comment, you know, on this program that we've been talking about. And my concern is that, well, there's only about 10 people in here that's got black hair. Uh, and there's a few of them in here don't have any at all. You know, and I don't have too much. I've been, I'm, I'm growing. I'm getting taller. You know, I'm growing right up through it. And uh, my experience is that when we lose a square dancer, when we lose a square dancer or a couple, unless they dropped out of square dancing for a good reason, like they had a baby or she broke her leg, or he had to have drastic surgery, unless you lose them through that kind of a thing, you never get them back. You never get them back. And you never lose one couple. You lose a whole square when one of them goes. See? And so I, I do one-night stands, and I, whenever I get an opportunity, I, I do something to promote square dancing. But I wonder if by getting these children in, you know, 10, 12, 14 years old. And then, you know, Sally is, she's a partner with John. And then when they get into high school, she throws John over, you know, and she goes with Jim. And he never was in that class, and he didn't, he didn't want to square dance anyhow. So you've lost her, too, and you've lost the first boy. Do we ever get him back? Thank you, Francis. Uh, we have a few uh, more comments that we need to make right here. First of all, the the dance that you're talking about, it's the Don Armstrong Memorial Weekend uh, coming up, and that'll be in Albuquerque. Yeah, uh, that's on the 25th, 26th, and 27th, Albuquerque. Yeah. May. Memorial Weekend. Okay, and... Uh, uh, let's see, I had another thought here I wanted to throw out at you, and it's sort of, this is what you call a senior moment, I think, uh, don't laugh, you've had these too, haven't you? Yeah, that's why you can laugh. Uh, those of you who haven't had them, you'll have them, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be there. But, uh, uh, again, back to a community dance program. Uh, it is very effective, and it, it can be used. Uh, many of the things in the community dance program can be used for your fun night, as well as many of the things you do at fun night can be used in the community dance program. Uh, but uh, from talking to Cal, uh, next year it will be scheduled the same way it was this year, preceding the Color Lab convention. So uh, get your request in early because we may have to go to a bigger facility for it. Uh, because that little room. Oh, I know what I was going to say. You were talking about 
demonstrations. You know, it was my understanding, and I think Joe had his same understanding, that we were going to have area for a square up here, and we could, you know, get you up here and do it. But when we got in here, we have 80 people in the room, and we only have room for 50 of you, then it, there's no place to dance. And, uh, yes, I think they should have given us an opportunity to dance. Now, if uh, you go to the uh, contra traditional interest session, which will be myself, uh, Mona Canal, and Jerry Hilt, and that'll be at Salon 1 and 2 uh, on uh, Tuesday at uh, 1.30. Uh, you'll find that we'll use some music, we'll use some demonstrations, and we'll get people on the floor. Uh, but uh, we just don't have the room here. But it was my understanding, I thought we were going to have room to dance, Joe. I don't know about He brought his records, so evidently he thought he was going to dance, too. So, uh, yeah, we were shortchanged, really, in the facility that... Yes. In the evening, there will be a uh, traditional contra, uh, traditional and contra dance. Uh, I don't know the hall. What halls are going to be in? Salon what? F. Salon F. And that's the annual thing that we do every year. Uh, and there'll be a lot of uh, traditional dances being called. There'll be a lot of uh, uh, odds and ends and uh, some... Uh, uh, contras and mixers and all that good stuff. Hello? Is that you? So, yeah, no. <laughs> that's, that's our ending signal. Okay, all right. Uh, I want to extend my appreciation for all of you being here, and we hope that you got something out of it, and Joe wants to say a few comments. Yes, we'd appreciate it if you did not get to sign the sheet, if you would. Uh, we do have some handouts here. I, these are mine, and those are ones that uh, Stu has made up. I would just like to end my little bit with thanking you for being here and once again r reminding you that the success of a fun night is, depends on enthusiasm and simplicity as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, and thank you, Stu. Thank you, Joe. It's been a pleasure. Thank all of you for coming and being with us.